Now, I've just been joined in the studio by Jamie. He's coming with a pint. This is Jamie Lowe, uh, who I was mentioning earlier. Filmmaker, did a film called Tales of Resistance. I met Jamie, I kind of actually, actually, I first met him on a demonstration. Well, that's right, isn't it? We were... 15, yeah, 20, austerity march. Yeah, an austerity march. So I was peddling through London with the sound system and we had a natter and actually you helped me get it home, didn't you? Well, no, actually, I, I saw you there and I filmed you a little bit and then I was on the bus home and then I saw you pushing it up a hill trying to get people <laughs> to come in and help you. And I got off the bus and I thought, oh, I'll go and help him. <laughs> Wicked. Like, thank you for that. Um, well, what a gentleman. And, uh, and then he sent me a kind of little cut of like the Dig It Sound System's antics on this march. So he made, made us a little movie, which was very, very generous and kind of you. Thank you very much. Uh, then he sent me a link to a film he's made, which um, I, I've asked him to come up and tell us about. Now, it's called Tales of Resistance, right? And it's about, essentially, the stories of the people at the Newbury Bypass, which was 1996. Yes. So... It, the film is a huge cache of footage shot by Jamie and by, by other people. Tell, who else? Because other people have contributed, right? I shot about eight or nine hours at the time right? Um, in 96. Um, but yeah, there was, uh, there was about 100 hours of footage. So only 10% of it is mine in some ways. I like, didn't work out exactly. Right, right. I used the footage, right. But, yeah. but, it was, but it was from other people who were obviously, obviously there at the time. Now, yeah. now... Um, uh, just just to give this a bit of context, yeah, um, I'm going to quote George Monbiot, who said the direct action campaign against road building in Britain was the most successful revolutionary movement in Western Europe in the t second half of the 20th century, because never before in this period have such radical aims be so, been so comprehensively achieved in such a short time. Never before has a central component of government policy to which billions had already been committed uh, been not simply removed, but almost wholly reversed without the need for a change of government solely by these citizens. Yeah. So he says that the, the people who made, who, who made this happen uh, have got so much plenty to be proud of. And these are the people who you chronicled, right? These are the people whose stories you told. So give us a bit of context. How old are you? What are you doing? Why did you end up there with a video camera? What, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the background? Tell us a bit about your, your, your life in movie making. I mean, you were out, just out of college, right? Yeah, I was just out of film school. And um, I got roped into a film about the whole M11 Link Road campaign in Claremont Road. And I didn't really know much about it, but as soon as I uh, got involved in that, I, I got hooked into the whole road protest movement, reclaim the streets in London. I mean, mm -hmm. I've always been London-based, and uh, so Newbury was was always on the cards. They almost did it in '94 or '95. Right. Then, then there was got, a public got, inquiry, got, wasn't there? I got put on hold, and then, and uh, but we always knew it was going to be the big one because it was nine miles of, of beautiful countryside. Half of it was a, an old railway line, um, but that was a beautiful like right around the corner, right around Park and Bork, right? Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, um, so yeah, no, it was uh, it was a big one, and we uh, we all knew it was going to, you know, it was a possible possibly winnable in some right. ways and and claremont road you mentioned which was where they were going to build a link to the m11 it's up in Leighton, and yeah. they people occupied houses there didn't they they houses. it was an urban version almost of mm. newbury right they they kind of squatted a row of houses which were going to be demolished mm -hmm. and made it very very difficult for 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 the people building the road to, to get although it happened in the end right yes, yeah, yes yeah, it did, yeah yeah it's there right now. so over at newbury um there'd been as you say, in the build-up, there'd been a series of other road protests. There'd been one in uh, near Winchester, which was Twyford Down, right? Yeah. And this was all part of, at the time, the road's budget was £23 billion. Pounds. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was totally into it. She called it the great car economy and had boasted the biggest road-building programme since the Romans. And he, she, you know, she didn't like the idea of public transport. That's too socialist, interaction, mm. unionism. She was banging to making sure we were all in cars. So, so... Newbury Bypass was going to go through. Let's let's just look at some of the figures here, right? Because it was it was it was nine miles long, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, it passed through three areas on the Wessex Downs, which were of outstanding natural beauty. Yeah. An ancient Stone Age settlement, eleven other really important archaeological sites, two perfectly preserved Civil War battle sites, mm. and it also destroyed the habitats of you know what kingfishers, nightjars, uh, bats, dormice, loads and loads of protected species. Um, and it, but it wasn't. It, they, they chopped down ten thousand trees, but it wasn't actually necessary, was it? Tell us about the arguments of what. But I mean, I, I mean, I've laid out why what they were going to do, but why why did, why did protesters feel so feel that uh, it wasn't it wasn't 
um, economically right and it wouldn't actually solve the, car, the, the issue with the traffic in Newbury. I think the protesters, you know, their, and their core belief was that, that, that the cars weren't in the future and, uh, and that we should be putting... Uh, I mean, there was a lot of freight uh, going through the town centre on the way to the port, Southampton, Portsmouth. And, and it wasn't going to solve uh, Newbury's traffic problem either. It was the, that was a very local problem. Mm. Uh, they were trying to build... It was part of a, a trans-European network. It was trying down from Glasgow to northern Spain, right? They yeah, wanted a motorway exactly. that stretched, I mean, yeah, right? I don't, I, I don't know if that exists now. Or, you know, I, I never followed through with that. But it's right what you say, because only 15% of the traffic from Newbury Town Centre would have been removed, because most, most of it was local. Um, mm. And there are other ways around it. I read in cartoon Kate, who features in the film, we'll mm. ask, you, ask you a little bit about her in a moment, but I read in one of her books that there were five roundabouts there was already kind of a bypass but they had five, these five roundabouts and there was a Sainsbury's on one of those roundabouts where they'd installed traffic lights so the road really became, there's a big backlog and the answer could have been would either sort out how you get into the superstore or build tunnels under the roundabouts or of course invest in public transport but instead they decided to destroy this ancient forest yeah. um, the film tells us you know it gives us the background but one of the, the thing which i found so so striking about it is how it really is boots on the ground you really did see this all pan out give me a little bit of a flavor of what it was like when you first showed up did the i mean did you just walk up to the people there did you know anyone there already or did you just rock up with a camera yeah no i'd, I'd already been filming in london reclaim the streets and stuff and so i'd met a lot of people and i did have a, some contacts there and uh, and i went and stayed with them um but yeah, it was very different, very different to what I was used to. I hadn't, uh, my, all, my, all my work had been in London doing critical masses with the bike rides and things like that. So very urban. So going out there was, uh, was, 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 was very different to what I was used to. And um, I mean, to this day, actually, I, I, I truly regret not ever building my own treehouse. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was a one chance you could get to build your own treehouse in a beautiful oak tree and live there. But, you know, it's also important to remember it was... It was a freezing cold winter, yeah. and it, you know it wasn't easy. I mean, that, some people were there in the summer, but that, nothing was really going on. Well, well it, it, the evictions started in March, right? So March '96. So mm. people had been living there in, in tree houses, really knowing it was coming from early January. And as you say in the film, you can see the sort of conditions people were having to put up with. It sort of extreme bravery, courage, and determination. Mm. Um, then the eviction started in uh, in March, but the actual Security and contractors came onto the came onto the site in January. So you know it was very active in January. Probably. Right, lots of skirmishes, lots of uh, tree, uh, you know, clearance work and stuff like that. But actually pulling people physically out of the trees was 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 March, and going through the the, the thirty old camps was March. Well, we're going to talk about that again in a minute. I'm going to play another tune because I've got a bag of big bag of records with me that I got to work through by seven so i'm going to just interrupt us there for a moment and drop in some reggae music and have a big sip of my guinness <laughs> and i'm going to ask you about that very thing in a moment yeah nice one this is a chronic stream called dread so i've got with me jamie lowe who's a filmmaker we've been having a chat about his latest movie called tales of resistance which is a film you can see actually on youtube it's a, it's up up on youtube so you don't have to go to the cinema to watch it so go off as soon as this show's finished go online and find it tales of resistance by jamie lowe and it's the story of the protesters at the newbury bypass back in 1996 now jay every day at newbury while they were evicting people you get what 1600 2000 security guards showing up being bussed in the film features quite a lot of what uh, of these people who were living in what warehouses or i mean where did all these security guards come from because they were bussed in for particularly for for the demonstrations for the protests right yeah. who were they well there were a mix of people i mean there were people from job centers who were told that you know if they don't go and do this they'll get you know they'll get docked and uh, they were uh, uh, they were all from, from all walks of life getting mm. four or I think four pound an hour or something like that, and they were all living in a in an ex MOD site somewhere in a big warehouse. Just uh, I mean, it features in the film. You see all yeah. these bunks just just laid out across a big space, and and uh, you know they were, the, the local villagers around there weren't very happy about it, and there were stories of big fights and division. I think there was a whole French contingent of uh, of, of workers as well that right. came over and. Uh, uh, famously, uh, the journalist John Vidal. Oh yeah, uh, he, he 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 joined as a security guard. Wow! And uh, and and because his French is very good, he uh, he called himself 
Frenchy or something, mm. and, uh, and and pretended he was French so that he could sneak in. And, uh, he, he's the uh, Guardian's environment correspondent. That's right, he? and he was yeah. he was on the case, uh, doing you know daily, weekly uh, stories about the the, the protests. Um, but of course, because there was this French contingent, one of them came up to him and said, "Where are you from?" He said, oh, "I'm from Paris." And then he goes, "No, you're not." He goes, "Please don't give me away." Please don't give me away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he rumbled. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. And and they they uh, the film shows you know it's really quite it's quite scary and kind of quite brutal the sort of le- the the level of aggravation between some of the some of the security blokes and and the protesters um they weren't uh light-handed um there was also correct me if i'm wrong there was there were teams of professional climbers brought in right yeah. tell me their story they feature in the movie who were they well, we How were they were received? We called them the Sheffield Climbers because I, I'm pretty sure they were all from Sheffield because Sheffield was a, a mecca for climbing at the time. Right. And uh, basically they worked uh, for a company that did rope access work, you know, for cleaning buildings and things like that. So they were all trained up for that. And they'd done a few other evictions at the time. Uh, they'd done uh, evictions in Cellar. There was an open cast mine. Right. And uh, so they were kind of well known by that point. You know, there was even one guy with a big long dreads and everything. So they, everyone knew their names. And, uh, and they were ostracized by the climbing community at the time because, you know, climbers thought that was the wrong thing to do. To, 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 you know, that was what they loved, to climb in nature and stuff. So, you know, it really grated with them. And uh, they were banned from quite a few of the climbing clubs around the country. Because right. of their actions, and they were, they would have been employed by what the Ministry of Transport to. Uh, I, I always they put part of the contractors. I'm not I'm never quite sure what the relationship because they were working on behalf of the sheriff, the bailiffs, or. Yeah, what could, yeah. The reason I ask this is what gave them the legal right to go up a tree and pull someone down, um, because it's it, it, you know. I'm pretty sure, if my memory serves me right, they were sworn in as sheriffs of right. some sort. So they were working for the, the sheriff right. who was responsible for the evictions. But, you know, the Department of Transport, I think, were paying for all the security. I, you know, it, it was all quite... It was just mm. the government. I mean, because yeah. uh, no contractors had actually been brought in to build the road yet. Right, so, so this, was, this pure, was the clearing. Department of Transport right, right. and the, the sheriff and, yeah. Um, there's a there's a there's a mention in in the film of something called the Newbury sausage. Oh, okay. Tell me about the Newbury sausage. So the, the the road was kind of you know it wasn't a straight road. It's slightly bent a little bit, and mm. uh, and if you got arrested um, more than once, I guess uh, the judge would say uh, you weren't allowed to go anywhere near the route. Your bail would say yeah, and they give your you bail conditions. Or, yeah, yeah, the bail conditions would say you're not allowed anywhere within a certain radius of the route, and because of the, the, the sort of slightly bent. <laughs> shape of the road itself they would draw draw this sort of map and with a big sort of round circle around it which looked like a sausage so, so it, we, we all called it the sausage the newbie know. sausage yeah, brilliant yeah, yeah. brilliant and uh, you, you, your film what, you've tracked down like lots of the people who were there and i'll interviewed them 20 years later hmm. um so they're kind of looking back at what they achieved um tell me about some of the characters there's, as i mentioned earlier there's a lady called cartoon kate who wrote a book called cops Br- brilliant sort of graphic uh, but I wouldn't say graphic novel because it's not it's non-fiction, but kind of like, has the style of a graphic novel in parts about road protests. Um, mm. Tell me about Kate and some of the other people who were there. Well, how do they consider what happened to them 20 years ago? Because, I mean, as I say, some of the footage is quite gnarly. It was obviously something which deeply affected them all. Mm. Yeah, I mean, when I first started to try and track these people down, you know, I was kind of half expecting some of them to go, oh, you know, that was then, this is now, I don't really want to talk about it, but... Most, predominantly, like 95% of the time, people would say to me, you know, I am who I am because of that, those, those days. And it wasn't just Newbury, obviously. It was that whole kind of road mo- anti-road movement at the time. And, uh, yeah, Cartoon Kate, who, 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 who's, you know, still busy doing her novel, uh, not novels, but her, her, her graphic uh, books. And um, she was actually doing cartoons for The Guardian during the protest as well. So some of the stuff from Cops was you know was being drawn at the time and the guardian were were you know taking it in so you know it was uh, it, it was it was it was, it was uh, i think where she actually started doing that sort of stuff right yeah and are they all generally still involved with uh, sort of environmental action or yeah yeah in, in many different ways obviously kind of with NGOs and stuff, and they, a lot of people have kids now, so you know they can't really be as uh, <laughs> uh, as as crazy as they were. But um, no, absolutely, um, 
you know, I, I see them all the time on, on various social media kind of picking this up and doing that and shouting about this and you know, so it's uh, everyone's still very busy. Excellent, excellent. I'm gonna play a, a tune by Black Uhuru now. Um it's called Spongy Reggae. Nice one. You're in tune to the Boogaloo Radio. Here we go. Now, Jamie, um, I wanted to ask you, you're in, in the film, um, we get kind of a kind of nice insider's view of what the camps were like uh, along the Newbury Bypass route. Um, give me a little bit of flavour, because some, some were on the, obviously on the ground, right? Some were up in the trees, and they also dug tunnels, right? Yeah. What, walk me into one of the camps. Take me to, I don't know, Kennet Camp or somewhere. What was it like? What were the conditions like? How are they organised? I mean, well, how did they eat? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of the... They, they had kitchens. You know, a lot of them had uh, kitchens on the ground, little sort of ground tents. But, you know, mostly people were up in the trees. Uh, like I said, pe- people building tree houses. And, and uh, I mean, to start, there were a few main camps, like Snellsmore and Kennet and The Chase and Tot Hill. You know, they, these were camps that, you know... And loads of camps sprung up in between them. And sometimes these camps didn't even um exist well they, they you know they didn't have people in them but every time they they put a camp together the the the, the dot the department of transport would have to get an eviction order for it so you know it was all these sort of little camps that you know and but by the end by you know by march 96 there was i would say 40 plus camps um Wow. That, were, that legally needed to be evicted. Whether they were, whether like you know, a good third of them were populated, I don't know. But you know, once a, once a camp would get evicted, people would kind of scuttle onto the next one, and, 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 and you know, and there were people who were just going up and down the route building tree houses, and uh, who were really good at it. And what uh, sort of stuff did they use? Give me. I'm a bit of a like, I love the artist, little boy inside me. Mm. Tell me how the hell would they build? Or how how would they choose the tree? I mean, how would they build the tree house? Oh, I don't they? know how they would choose the tree. I mean, it, it would have to be in that in, in in a vicinity where a camp was, obviously. Yeah. They they declared a camp. Um, but there, yeah, they would. Um, polyprop was was, right. was was a big thing. This 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 blue polypropylene rope. That, yeah. uh, and they also the, people believed that that there was a possibility that the, um, the, the, the that they could win. So you know they were protecting the trees. No one would bang a nail into a tree. Right. So they would have all these ways of wrapping uh, beams. You know they create a frame around the uh, you know one or two trees or three trees and then wrap it and they'd have special techniques of doing it so they, they'd wrap branches with carpet right before they put the the rope round so, yeah. so they wouldn't rub so, into yeah, it yeah. wasn't just nails yeah. it was yeah. also protecting the bark and yeah. everything because you know that was you know there was no point in doing it if they didn't you know but then that wasn't always the case i mean some t- some camps you know some camps you know camps were different you know you had like fluffy camps fluffy camps and spiky camps and right. spiky camps were you know, usually a lot of drinking and and a bit more anarchistic. And right. then the fluffy camps, you know, they were a bit more sort of the hippie eco types. And you know, so um, you know, it, it, it they did vary. And and you know, like someone says in the film, you know, some camps they would just welcome you in. Other camps, it would be like, oh dear, you know, it's like. <laughs> This is, they're all a bit they're all a bit raucous here <laughs> <laughs> and um as you say there's some some of the some of the camps in your film um really high up some quite gnarly trees and with with they'd have walkways between tree to tree so people could go from one side to the other to to visit their mates they could mm. uh they didn't have to touch the ground i mean but with there, there stories of people staying up up there for serious i mean for months on end for weeks on end um, I mean, some people were there for a good couple of years right. because, like I said, it was it, it was on and off this this road. And uh, but yeah, during those three months, yeah, people had their own tree houses and they would live up there. And uh, and you wouldn't need to come down because you know you just if you, if you needed supplies, you throw a rope down and drag it up. And uh, but the walkways were also a defence mechanism because if you were in the middle of a walkway in between two trees, they couldn't cut either tree down. They'd have to come and get you. 
And so there'd be this sort of, you know, this this fight in between the walkways, and you know, and there's got quite a lot of footage of that in your film, isn't there? I mean, there's um, mm. there's there's some uh, scenes of of people being taken down by cherry pickers, right? Yeah, yeah. Tell us the story about the the world, the Europe's biggest cherry picker, because it's one of the it's one of the parts of the film where you kind of the film's for the moments where I actually felt really quite sad. You know, you see these magnificent oaks just tumbling to the ground, and you see people standing around, feeling, you know, p- proper sad about it. I mean, it really is quite touching but there is one moment in that film when a tree comes down and there's a little kind of i had to smirk a bit <laughs> tell me about europe's biggest cherry picker why was it bought on the site so this was another one of the main camps called reddings cops and it had the tallest tree on route which which i think was a scots pine right. um i keep people keep correcting me saying this or it's that but it was just very tall i'm not really sure how tall i'm terrible with numbers but um they had to bring in the biggest cherry picker in Europe, which came from, I think it was the Netherlands. And um, I mean, <laughs> one of the stories that I don't bring up in the film, because there are so many little stories that, you know, I mean, to tell them all would be take too long. But uh, they uh, it, it got sabotaged um, before it even arrived in the Netherlands by activists out there who knew where it was going. Um, but they finally did get it in and... Uh, and it was a big day, and, and you know, they, they, this tree had a little uh, flag on the top, had a ladder coming out the top of it, yeah. <laughs> just to extend the tree that tiny bit more with a flag on top of it. And uh, the cherry pick, uh, the bailiffs went up there and went all the way up the top just to test it all, and they got right to the top, ripped the flag off, and <laughs> wiggled their asses as they came down, and you know, a bit childish about it. And uh, and then they started to try and evict people, and around that camp they were they were also pulling down some lovely oak trees as well some 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 probably older than the scots pine itself but one of them came down and as it came down it twisted in a weird way and and fell on the cherry picker and uh, not only on the this the, the biggest cherry picker in europe but on the control panel itself <laughs> and completely ruined it and you know and dangerously it actually hit one of these sheffield climbers uh-huh. they all had to run they saw it coming they had big kind of agile men they all got away except one who got got thwarted on the head and that was quite scary because you know no matter how much you hate these people you don't don't wish you me no, like no, not at all and uh but no he was okay um, and but the uh, cherry picker wasn't the cherry, the cherry picker, picker wasn't. I had to go away, and and it wasn't until a week later they could get another one. Is that brilliant? <laughs> so I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, the, the tree's the revenge. revenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely, man. All right, I'm going to play another tune. Uh, this is a tune called "Follow Me." It is by Danny T. What it is? It's, um, the featuring Dark Angel. Oh, no. Nice one, this one. I say modern reggae music. Now, uh, I'm going to ask Jamie um, about some of the other people in his movie, Tales of Resistance, which I uh, say so you can watch on YouTube. Um, in fact, what's the, uh, tell me what the address is, www.talesofresistance. No, 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 it's uh, www.newburybypassfilm.info. .info, okay, yeah. so newburybypassfilm.info, so go online and check that out. So in the movie, there's this one moment where there's this bloke, called Balin, right? Mm-hmm. Um, who you see get really quite violently evicted from a tree. He's really quite high up and it doesn't look like he's got a harness on. Tell us about his story. Who was he and um, what was his role down at Newbury? So Balin was really interesting. I mean, he got his name from uh, um, Lord of the Rings. Rings. Yeah, say, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that wasn't his real name. Um, but he was a huge guy, a gentle giant. And he was, unlike a lot of the protesters, very local. And well, he, hang, he, he, he says actually in the film, doesn't he? Oh man, this River Lambourne. I remember English crayfish in there as a kid and going and playing mm. up there. So he grew he grew up there, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, no. He told me he had his like he had his first kiss in Snellsmore Wood, and you know, I mean, he was a, he was a proper local, and there weren't that many protesters who were local. There were, you know, there was a good good chunk. But what, what, before we go to Spanish, just a quick aside yeah. there um, with with. The, the local issue they, but the, you, there weren't, might not be very, very many local protests there but there was local there was support from the local community right oh yeah no that they you know i mean you know you were either for or against it there was a good 
lot that were against, that were for the road that right. wanted the road, but there were a lot of people uh, against it, and they would provide so much support, you know, bringing hot food down and uh, and, and 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 supplies and and stuff to build tree houses with anything they could find, and bringing it along, you know, and just really making sure everyone was, uh, you know, doing what they could, you know, to to help them. So as I say, Ballymore was one of these people who grew up locally, knew the area, has been someone he'd spent lots of time as a child. Um, tell me his story then. What did he did he did, did he join the protest quite early on or? Ballon was one of the original there. I mean, I could name three people um, that that were there from the very outset. And uh, um, but I think back as early as '94, the uh, somebody I don't know who was employing people to destroy the bat roosts and the dormice colonies because they knew that if you know they were there that would create issues for them to get them licensed to do the evictions and stuff so he was there from early from early on and uh and his main camp was Granny Ash, but he also, uh, in January, he um, someone came into Granny Ash and said, "We need to block this field because they want to build a, a little base there for the security, you know, a little kind of outpost or whatever." And he, he, they put up a tripod, which is uh, three scaffolding poles, yeah. and uh, and he sat on top of this tripod, you know, and it's impossible to to get someone well it's very difficult to get someone down from there because you can't just pull any of the poles, otherwise it will cripple or maim a person. Yeah. So he was up there for, I mean. He became this sort of hero to everyone on the route because he was there for three weeks. You know, he was up there day and night for three weeks. Mm. And uh, and uh, and then, of course, it came to his eviction. And, uh, you know, being such a big guy, he was, you know, he was, it was very hard to pull out of the trees. And, and he was defending all the kind of younger, 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 smaller people there, if you like. And, uh, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I really, really wanted him in the film. And, uh, I, but he was very hard to find. First of all, I had to find out his real name, but still that was difficult. And I found out actually he was um, at, a, at a camp in Kew Gardens um, in about 2012 or something where they wanted to build a luxury development. And I went down there and they said, oh, yeah, he's here. But, you know, he goes out and hands out sandwiches to, 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 to homeless people in uh, Trafalgar Square. So if you go down to this place, you know, outside Ryman's or something like that, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll find him. And I was, I, I was standing outside there, couldn't see any homes. You know, it was really difficult. And then suddenly out the corner of my eye, coming through, literally coming out of uh, the, the roundabout on Trafalgar Square, there's this guy, you know, with this big laden bike with a big box of sandwiches. And I ran up to him and I said, Balin, Balin. And he goes, yeah. And, uh, and I said, oh, and I explained who I was. And I said, I'm making a film about Newby. And he looked at me and he went, why <laughs> <laughs> but but we've become good friends since then and uh and 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 he did, he, he told a story really nicely i think yeah he was he's a extremely eloquent um interview i mean it's a lovely interview um, mm. and you can see as i say he, he 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 talks of what what was lost and you can really sense mm. that there is a, an element of that you know the deep loss of actually something which was just so so beautiful and part of his childhood you yes, know absolutely uh, my dad has gets gets misty eyed when we go over the Westway because his childhood home was demolished for that wow. for that for that road. But um, mm. uh, yeah, you've been in tune to me, Dan Carrier of the Diggit Sound System, with filmmaker Jamie Lowe, my special guest uh, this week. It's been really lovely to hear his story about tales of resistance. And give us the website address again, yeah. Newbury Bypass film dot info and uh, please do go on and and uh watch it and share it yeah you i mean it's on youtube right so yeah it's out there and yeah. if there, anyone out there, out there also listening runs film festivals or anything please you should you need to get in touch with this guy go onto his website um and get him to come along and have a chat about uh, about his brilliant movie get his film shown as far and wide as possible it, one thing which really struck me as well about the movie is actually whilst it's quite a sad story because this road was built and this place was trashed they did win the war. They did reverse the government policy um, in terms of road building. And you said, I mean, I mean, people today should really take heart. And you, I think you, you said to me uh, when I interviewed you for the New Journal that you thought maybe today they would have won. They might well have won it. I mean, stop the road being built because of social media and videos. And so lots of people couldn't have got away with the... The bailiffs wouldn't have been able to get away with half the stuff they did. Yeah, no, it's important to remember that, that hardly anyone had a mobile phone. There's a funny story I didn't put in the film about, you know, that's, you know, someone having one and, and it ringing and everyone looking at it and not knowing how to answer it. You know? I mean, it was, it was a bit like that. We were using CB radios in between the tree houses. So um, if we, had, you know, I mean, you could be transmitting live from an eviction up in a tree and, 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 and the... The, the, the general public would just be incensed by what was going on and what was uh, what was hidden from public view. 
Um, so, yeah, no, I, I truly wonder whether it would have succeeded. Right, right. And then um, did they, they, they... Just one more thing about that. They, you, you mentioned CB radios, because in the film there's, a, there's an office somewhere in Newbury yes. which sort of coordinated. How did that... Who who ran that? How where did they get the space for? Was it, I mean, how did that work? Ooh. Was there a coordinated? Because ca- Friends of the Earth helped a bit, didn't they? Oh no, Friends of the Earth. Uh, the, you know, they they definitely worked alongside the the, the grassroots campaigners and 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 that they, they put it into the national media. You know, they uh, they made sure that everyone was aware was that what was going on, and uh, they were. Uh, uh, an incredible ally to have at the time. Yeah, there was a couple of offices, and uh, and there was a there was a grassroots organisation called Road Alert, right? That were putting out uh, bulletins throughout the nineties about you know they started in Twyford. They were right. you know they were kind of you know they they they, they, they came from from that protest, and uh, they had an office, and that was where. They had the kind of the biggest antenna for the CB radios and could communicate all to the to all the camps. We also had a relay station. I mean, it was such nine miles, so they had to have a relay station in the middle. Um, that would, so you know, message would be passed on up Brilliant. the route because you know the transmitters wouldn't be that. You know, I mean, this is really old school. You don't, yeah, you know, like I say, no mobile phones, no, and and, and barely any internet. I mean. Mm. Internet was there, but uh, and and there were things going out, but no one really had it at the time. It well, it's the, funny because you, you you mentioned um, in the film about you know there'd be you would, people would know which camp was going to be evicted that day, so you'd have, it was a bit of a cat and mouse game with the police that you'd wait for, to see where the bailiffs and police were heading towards, and then tip that camp off, and people would rush to go and offer their extra support. Yeah, right? you had uh, you had uh, had people in in, in spotter cars uh, in in the, in the early morning because I think the uh, a lot of the, the the climbers and the sheriff were based at the the race course in right. Newbury, and so you would follow their convoys because they would keep it secret because if everyone knew which camp they were going to that morning, everyone would pile in there, wouldn't they? So uh, the idea was to try and find out, you know, where, which, which, uh, which camp which was, next. was next. And uh, you'd only ever know like 15 minutes prior, you know, to, 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 to camp being... Oh, they're going that sort of direction. But of course, camps were quite close, so... So he was able... He was still, still, it was still quite, you know... I'm going to play a tune by Floyd Africa now called Call Your Bluff. Uh, so you've been tuned to me, Dan Carrier, of the Diggit Sound System with my special guest filmmaker, Jamie Lay. Check this tune out. It's an absolute banger. <laughs> I've had a guest in today. It's been Jamie Lowe, who has um, made this film called Tales of Resistance. I'm going to ask him just to come on one more time and uh, give uh, give us give us the details of where you can watch this film. Give, plug, give us a bit of a plug, Jay. Tell yeah. us about like, like, where's your website. What can we see if we go on it? You put some you put some other information about Newbury up there as well, haven't you? The idea is that I want to do that, um, <laughs> but at the moment it's just um, it's it's just the film itself. And I did a trailer back in the day because um, this film. Embarrassingly, it took me eight years to make, and that's not. It didn't take me eight years to actually make. It, it took me eight years between life, love, and work to make. So right. you know, I mean, it was constantly put on the back burner. I, 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 it was completely. It was. It had a zero budget, and so you know, as as all good projects are, there was the uh, there was the nurturing bit, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, it <laughs> was a, a total labour of love. Well, I'm going to play a Dread Zone tune because Dread Zone feature in your movie. Oh, yeah. uh, in terms of you've, uh, you've you've got some Dread Zone in the background, so let's play let's play Mountain by Dread Zone. This is a this is a lovely bit of British reggae music dating back from, from the day, actually, from the 90s, this one. Yep. Check it out. We've got to climb. Release the problems of your mind. On the mountain top, where the pressures drop, yeah. 